Ken, most of you know Ken is a, is a partner at Sway, um, has, has the uh, distinct pleasure of serving on a few boards that you've, you might be familiar with, Costco and Motorola and Lending Club and a few others. Uh, but he's actually an entrepreneur at heart. He's been running public and privately held technology companies here in Silicon Valley for a long time. We actually got to know Ken because he pitched us a, a deal, a company he was running machine learning for video analytics a few years ago. And like idiots, we didn't uh, suit up and get it done. And he got it into a, a bidding war with uh, Larry Page and Tim Cook. And Tim won that one. And we lost. So we said, all right, Ken, you need to come work with us now. And he was crazy enough to say yes. Um, Stacy is a great friend of the firm. You, you may have read her background on the invitation tonight. She worked at Google for a decade and ran some very important functions for them and some of the biggest growth uh, initiatives that they had corporate-wide. Um, and came out of there, took a job working at TaskRabbit, which you're going to hear a lot about TaskRabbit tonight. And we looked at TaskRabbit like idiots. We didn't do that deal. <laughs> so we're really bad at venture capital is what I'm trying to say here. Um, Stacy, Stacy had an exit selling TaskRabbit to Ikea. And there's a really cool story about how that went down. But tonight's really about the future of work. And thank you to our sponsors and the great you know, prep talk earlier. Future of work is part of our thesis at Sway. And, and I'm going to ask my co-founder, Bill, to give you guys some, some of our context on top of the great context you heard a minute ago about how we think about the future of work. But we've asked Ken and Stacy to have a conversation initially in front of the room about you know, how they think about the future of work. TaskRabbit is a pioneer of taking freelance labor and you know, kind of disintermediating the traditional approaches that we take to get labor to our home, to our office, our place of business, et cetera. And uh, she's built an incredibly successful business in that. So we're going to tie all this together. What I'd ask each and every one of you to think about as you hear uh, what they have to say is start thinking about points that you'd like to add to the discussion. It doesn't have to be a question. It could be an assertion. It could be a question. If it's a great joke, we'll take that too. Uh, but this, these, for those of you that haven't been to our pairings dinners before, these are highly interactive. So we're trying to get everybody in the room engaged in the conversation, and we'll just keep it rolling until you know the conversation is no longer interesting. So with that, I'm going to ask my co-founder Bill Malloy to talk a little bit about the future of work, and then hand the mic over to our friends. All right. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, I think very briefly. Look, what motivates us at Sway is looking at how software can improve uh, everyday lives. And it's interesting when I think about TaskRabbit, when I think about Emotion, like we look at deals in terms of enterprise and consumer. And for enterprise, it's business efficiency, it's the security of businesses. And then when we look at consumer deals, we're, we're literally looking at how does this software improve the everyday lives, whether that's from a healthcare standpoint or just making people's lives more enjoyable. But I think the interesting thing you'll hear about today is there are actually ways to impact both, meaning being able to drive investment in enterprise businesses that then drive more money into the, the end people's lives, right? Us as a workforce, we can make more money, we can use our time more efficiently to do the things we love. That could be working more, like Greg, who never stops, or it could be spending more time with your kids, kids like Ken. So I, I think for us, it's really exciting to have two uh, industry veterans here. And with that, I hand it over to you guys, and thank you for your time. Great. Thanks, Bill and Brian. Well, first of all, Stacey, it's great to have you here. Thank you for, for, for joining us. I, I've, I've, been, I've known Stacey for a few years now, and we keep, Silicon Valley is actually a fairly small world, if, if you haven't, if you, those of you that haven't experienced that. And so um, when you, there, there are a group of people that are getting stuff done, and she was certainly one of those. So kind of most of the places where I would go, people would, I'd either bump into her, or people would say, do you know Stacy?" Or uh, you know they would talk about companies that were really successful and sort of you know leaping tall buildings and 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 in any list of five companies this was one of the companies that people were talking about. You can imagine, especially with what's going on in the gig economy the last many years, that that would be the case. So what I thought we'd do is start off. Even though you've seen the bios, I'd really I always think it's better when you hear from the person their own story. And so I, I was. You, you grew up in, in Detroit in the 80s, and you saw jobs leaving, um, and you saw the impact on the community. 
you go off to the Ivy League and, 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 and to Wharton, you get into the banking industry, and then you leave banking and you go to Google, and then you leave Google and take on the TaskRabbit opportunity. Um, and, and that kind of brings us up to date, but I'd really love to hear your version of the real story, because there's always the real story underneath the personal story to the extent that you're willing to share. Um, so first, the, the underpinning theme of my life has been about missions. And we talk in Silicon Valley about like missionaries versus mercenaries, and people write about it all the time, and everyone wants to, no one wants to invest in the mercenary, everyone wants to invest in the missionary. Sometimes they invest in the mercenaries because they wouldn't exist if you didn't. So, um, and I've always been attracted to the mission, and the mission always goes back to people for me. Um, when I came in, I've never had a welcome like this before. I've never had TaskRabbit inspired cocktails, which I thought was incredible. I took a picture of it and sent it to my assistant and um, my head of PR, and they're going to copy it maybe for our holiday party. I'm just going to let you know. And if we do, I'll send you a picture <laughs> of that. Um, and people always use, um, often use TaskRabbit, or even if they don't, they know I'm coming, so they'll use TaskRabbit just so they have a story to tell. Um, and two things just happened here, which was the taskers that I met at the front, I hope you all were very kind to them and very nice to them because um, they're an important part of our community, um, have been working with Sway for a long time. And so this isn't about a one-off relationship. It's about a network that you're building help for life with. And it's about the people and the relationships that you build over time with them. Um, and they seemed very happy when they came in, so that means you guys must be doing a very good job, so thank you for that. Um, and you all seem very pleased with your experience here at this event, which means the two of them are doing an amazing job providing a great service. And that's really why I do what I do. And it's, and so everything I've ever done has been about the people, and that's what's mattered. So when I left Detroit, my, my community, I grew up on the west side. For anybody who knows the Midwest and Detroit, we talk about where we grew up, and it wasn't Detroit or like the suburbs. It was not the suburbs. It was the city of Detroit. It was the west side, and we didn't have a lot of stuff. Like it was my mom, my brother. We had three generations of women, four at one point in our house. Um, my parents got divorced when I was very young, and so we just survived and did what we did. And she made a lot of sacrifices for us. But we always had community. And so when, you, when I went through life, it was always like, well, this is really hard. Um, but when I look back on life, I think about the fun stuff, like the block parties with Motown music. I will crush you on any Motown song. <laughs> Anyone, just bring it. Um, so, and, and, but I also look back on the importance of education and the importance of really pushing through the challenges that you face. Um, people talk about grit today and how they teach grit, but it's, sometimes it's just how you grow up. You have to learn it in order to survive. So the journey from that and seeing the auto industry decline was horrible. People were hardworking people with solid work ethic, work ethic, and they just couldn't find jobs. And now I get to work at this amazing company that creates jobs every day for people who need something done and for people who need to make some money and it's meaningful work. The average hourly rate is $35 an hour and there's a lot of places, most places you can't find that. So those, the journey has really been about how do I really make my life matter more than the other people made it matter for me. Um, so many people touched me in different ways and so many people helped me. When I applied to Penn, um, it was, it doesn't sound, it's not gonna sound like help, but I'll tell this story, because I don't wanna do the bio part, right? You asked me to do like my own personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was sitting in the counseling center at my high school, and um, I had a scholarship to the University of Michigan, which was the number two business program, which is a great school. Everybody from my high school got into that school because they were smart, and they went to Michigan because they were smart. And I said, oh, wait a minute, there's this other school called Wharton that's like the number one business school. So I was like, hmm, I'm gonna apply to that. I just was like blindly like, I wanna go to the number one business school and I'm just gonna go. And I did. And 
that changed the course of my life. And that decision changed the course of my life. But I knew that I had a bigger purpose for what I was trying to accomplish. So ending up at Google, after working in investment banking and public accounting and coming out to go to business school at Stanford, my mother's like, I don't know about this Google thing. And I said, you know, it was 2003. It was 1,000 people at the company. I said, you know, you can always go back to Goldman Sachs. You can always go back to investment banking. Everybody knows Goldman Sachs. And I said, well, I don't know about it either, but maybe they'll go public and maybe something will happen and maybe this thing will work out. Um, but, you know, I went to Stanford, so probably I can get a job if it doesn't work out. And, you know, that, you know, the first job became the second job and the third job. And that's how I spent nine years at a company going from 1,000 to 50,000 people. I mean, it was incredible. But what drew me back to TaskRabbit was really the mission to make everyday life easier for everyday people. And the everyday people that grew up in my community, I wanted to figure out how to really touch them in a meaningful way. And that's what I get to do every single day. And so that's my journey. Very cool, very cool. And so let's keep that thread going along because if you sort of fast forward a little bit further after um, Google and you get to, uh, well, right about 2007, 2008, the economy's, you know, once again head, heading down. And um, uh, it's, it's the beginning of the recession. Ten years later, um, you know, TaskRabbit is creating meaningful work, meaningful jobs for a whole group of people who are not just surviving, they are thriving. So you, you managed to reduce friction in a way that you could support this new gig economy, but in a way that does service to real people. Um, tell us a little bit about that. How did that happen? It's, it's, it was a roller coaster. I joined in 2012, so four years after the company was founded. And, you know, pioneering something is like you start and there's this giant desert and somebody's like, somebody's got to walk across that desert. Okay. And you got to be the person, yeah. you know, to do it. And that's amazing. Um, what really has driven the success of TaskRabbit has been the focus on the community. We have 140,000 taskers now in our community. We just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. And we've saved people like 4 million hours of time. Um, on October 10th was our 10-year anniversary. And I spent the day calling our longest standing taskers. I just want to talk to them and say thank you. Um, and some of them were busy. Some of them, were, one guy was tasking and I talked to Mark all the time and um, I called him and he's like, hey Stacy, I'm about to go paint somebody's house. What do you want? And I said, well, it's our 10 year anniversary. I just want to say thank you. He said, like, oh, thank you for calling me. And you know, he was a general contractor in 2008. And so as you can imagine, anybody in that field lost everything. And he started tasking, and he's still tasked today, and he is a full-time tasker on TaskRabbit today. So how did somebody like that navigate through the waters of what the product became? We started as this open marketplace that you could bid on, and it was an okay experience, but we knew that that was not going to be experienced at scale. So when I got there in 2012, I said, all right, well, what's, what's, what are some of the core issues what are some of the core things that are going to help us drive growth? And it was about a coin flip chance of getting something done on TaskRabbit. 50% of the time, it may not happen because nobody was available or nobody was willing to pick up the task for the amount that you were willing to pay. And so in 2013, we decided to test an entirely new model in another country because we wanted a clean environment. So we launched TaskRabbit in London, in the UK. And it was sort of untouched, and they did no history, and we didn't have to worry about legacy. And it was very successful. And what we tested was what we brought back to the US in 2014 was the model that you see today, which is a direct hire model. You can see information about taskers, what their hourly rate is, how available they are. We collected things like their schedule. And then we focused on a few categories, which is around life at home that you can now just get done. So we could guarantee fulfillment. Our fulfillment rate went up to you know almost 100%. And we made sure that 
for the work that you wanted to get done, it was a high quality person that was gonna do that job. So it changed the trajectory of the company. We grew multiple X's and launched in 45 markets and now three countries. So that roller coaster was not easy to see because when we made that change in 2014, the taskers were upset. They were not happy. There were some categories we weren't doing anymore. We were trying to focus and like if you didn't win that list, um, it was bad, but we knew that we couldn't grow to 140,000 taskers by just limiting the business model, and so we had to make that change. And then a year ago, we said, you know what, we've got this great partnership, which I'm happy to talk about with IKEA, and it started to develop into more than just a partnership, so we agreed to sell the company to them last year, and a year in, the business has grown. We've tripled the size of the company in terms of employees. Um, we launched a new country, and you know, we're from here continuing to think about TaskRabbit is not just this transaction that you get done, but it's really help for life. It's a task management network for you. Well, I would imagine you've saved a lot of marriages because, uh, you know, <laughs> personally, um, you know, I, I'm not handy. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, uh, my wife likes I IKEA. And it's a problem, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, but if I extrapolate that out, I think, you know, just, just the ability to to have people take on tasks in a timely and high quality fashion. I mean, that's a big deal in more marriages than probably people in this room will even admit. <laughs> it is, we have a sign that we have some messaging in, in the office, just some signs to remind us of the community that we're a part of. Um, and one of them is about furniture assembly <laughs> and how she thought her husband could put together the furniture and she thought wrong. <laughs> Uh, I resonate with that. <laughs> um, so, you know, when you when I when I think about um, the, the the IKEA acquisition, you know, can you, is, to the extent you can, how how has it gone for you as a CEO of a of a fast growing uh, venture backed company to to step into a very large corporation? We all have uh, moments in our life where you're not really sure if it's the right decision. And when I decided to become CEO of TaskRabbit, it was 20, April of 2016, and I knew that was the right decision. I thought about, can I do something with this business that I couldn't do as COO, which was the role that I had before the CEO role, and I decided that I could. And so I took that job. I didn't take the job to sell the company. So December, we launched this partnership with IKEA, and it starts to go really well. And leading up to that, it was in August, a friend of mine who's a great, really good friend, we were going to hike, and she said, you know, now that you're CEO, people are going to start talking to you about buying the company. And you should, she, was, she had sold her company successfully, and she said, you should write down a list of the people you would sell the company to. That way you can focus. If people contact you that aren't on the list, you can just ignore them. But if they are on the list, you should pay attention. And so that advice was so wise because I thought, I said, you know, we're thinking about doing this deal with Ikea, and I don't know, it depends on how the deal goes, but I think I would put them on the list. I think it's a great company with some values. Um, so because I put Ikea on the list, we invested in the success of that partnership. And I spent the time to get to know the company. And six months in, it was successful for them. You could go to an Ikea store. We piloted it in London and get TaskRabbit services on the way out the door. So now you're buying more stuff because you're not the person who has to put it together. And after that, we sort of progressed into making this deal happen. Because we spent so much time together, we really knew each other. But you still don't know everything until you get on the inside. IKEA is one of the most successful private companies in the world. They're the world's largest furniture retailer. I had zero people in my LinkedIn network connected to them, zero people. And so I was trying to back channel and do all these things to see if we should do this deal. Um, and I just couldn't do it. So I had to go on the gut and the trust. We structured it in a way that's been good which is we run independently, we keep our TaskRabbit name and our TaskRabbit brand, and they've been really good about 
respecting that. It's a little bit like I think Microsoft and LinkedIn and how they've been able to structure things very well. Having said that, they're a great customer acquisition channel for us. Um, Furniture Assembly, as you can imagine, our fastest growing category. It's about 10% of the business. Now it was 2% you know, a year ago, so it's obviously grown, which is important. But they've given us the freedom to decide how we build a great service for IKEA customers. And for them, that's strategic because one, it gives them access to innovation and Silicon Valley talent. And two, as a product-led company, all the big box retailers have to figure out how services is gonna be a growth engine for them in the future. And we get to be the company that shapes that. Yeah, you really said a, a key word there when you said you're strategic to them. I mean, that I think that is really, really the key because then they can decide. I mean, we we all there's history of companies that screw up these acquisitions because they they touch it too much. They but you're fundamentally strategic to something they need done, and and I think if the culture works, that that that's that's pretty critical. Um, so labor has been um, losing out to automation for years, if not decades, and um, you know there's the sort of highly skilled roles going forward. And then there's the sort of uh, non-automated, localized roles. I think in which uh, task ra or taskers would kind of fit in. Although I, I personally have always felt that it's going to be um, you know, those jobs that will survive will be those where where there's it's a trade or it's a craft. It's really a combination of a skill set plus a humanity, personality. You know all uh, the things that 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 are required for somebody who's going to come into your home, for example, that would survive. But I, I, I'm really interested in sort of this nexus between the gig economy and the future. You know, where are we going? Where are we going with? It's it's like one percent or one percent and a half, but the census is growing rapidly. What's your view of where we're headed? Yeah, I I um, you know, one of the things that we always hear is, you know, these are trans, this is transient. And um, especially when I joined the company in 2012, I was like, oh, this gig economy is really not gonna last. I think people are over that now. Everyone knows that this is actually here to stay. And if you spend any time with anybody who is outside of Silicon Valley, no one's doing this because it's transient. Most people have a goal, and sometimes that's a permanent goal, which is I have a full-time job. That job is 30 hours a week, which is defined as full-time if you're a registered nurse, for example. That is not enough to pay my bills. I need a part-time job. I have two part-time jobs. Those jobs don't pay enough. I need a third part-time job. So this, is, this way of working is actually here yeah. to stay. I don't think that there's a question anymore about that. So I used to spend a lot of time talking about how it's here to stay. I think people get that now. I mean, we can debate who, if someone disagrees. I'm happy to have that debate. Now what I talk about is, well, what does that really mean over time? How do these roles change and become meaningful? And I think there's a couple of dimensions. One is around skill. I do believe that the, the angle on automation versus not automating things, the spectrum is around judgment and empathy. It's really hard still today to automate good judgment and empathy. And I think we could espouse lots of stories where machines have been taught to do things but lacked judgment and therefore made bad decisions. Um, and so it's really hard to teach that. So even as our taskers are doing things that maybe some robot could do someday, they still are human beings that are bringing judgment and empathy to the table. And so what we're trying to do is help our taskers develop skills over time that will allow them to continue to work the way that they work in the face of automation. So I remember um, a few months ago, earlier this year, I had a tasker come to my house and fix a light switch that was sort of not working. And Chris, my husband, was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. He never did it. So I finally got a, <laughs> a tasker to do it. And he shows up, and he's like, I remember you. And I was, 
I was like, you do? And he's like, you're the CEO of TaskRabbit because I never tell them. And it's hard to tell on my profile that it's me. Um, and I was like, how do you remember? He was like, you, your friend had a birthday party four years ago. And you hired somebody to sing happy birthday to them at a restaurant because you couldn't go to the party. Um, and I was like, yeah, I remember that Andre had a party. And I was like, well, how did you, wait a minute, how are you doing electrical work now? Because you were singing at the birthday party for a year. Can you do this job? Hold on. And he said, yeah. He's like, because of TaskRabbit, I've been able to go from $25 an hour job to $100 an hour jobs. And I said, how'd you do that? He said, well, I started doing deliveries and birthdays and singing. And um, I realized there's all these other things that you can do like electrical work. So I loved fixing things. So I went on YouTube and I taught myself how to do light switches and ceiling fans and, you know, light fixtures. Um, and I practiced at home. And then I started listing my experiences and took pictures of my work and put it on TaskRabbit. And now I make $100 an hour. So this is, this is a way of living and a way of work. And we have so much information available on the internet to teach yourself things. It's not even, we didn't even have to provide the education. We just had to provide the platform and the place and the opportunity to do it. So I believe that the empowerment that the gig economy has enabled for people like this person who came to my house is one that will shape the future and shape the way that we work. So even those of us who go inside buildings every day, we are working with people who want to be empowered, who want to develop, who want to take pride in what they do. And regardless of whether or not those people are independent contractors or W-2 as the government would describe them, it is our responsibility to enable that success. So that's really, that's really cool. You, you actually, I had jumped to sort of a, a conversation about tra craft and trade, but you reminded us just now that some folks start at the very basic level of tasks, getting stuff done that people need done. It may not have a great skill set to it, but there's an opportunity for them to move along a, a path to either greater skills. Um, so this is probably a good time for us to really get deeper into this conversation about the future of work. Because, um, you know, I, 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 I see, I do believe that where there is a, a need for empathy and humanity, um, there's going to be opportunity for people to contribute. I think we may have to change our mindset. Generationally, that's going to be a challenge for some people who have done certain kind of work. And if the disruption happens so fast, things change so quickly, the options for those folks may be limited, they may have to find another course. And, and, and I, I personally am deeply concerned. I believe there will be augmentation of humans through machine learning and deep learning. There'll be certain skill sets where we will, as a society, will be better off because, for instance, in surgery, you know, the top surgeons, the real advantage they have is time on target. They get to see more surgeries, more of a specific kind of surgery than other doctors. But if you could augment humans through machine learning and what, you know, really in, invasive or, 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 or um, immersive technologies and give people more experience. You could uplift a whole set of surgeons to be more competent. But then at the other end, sort of this, uh, there's this other category of uh, sort of non-skilled work. Uh, and, and there's this compression of, of time. The disruption happens so quickly. I'm deeply concerned that TaskRabbit can't save them all and that, that we will see a couple, maybe three generations of workers, parts of the population, and not an insignificant part, who will fundamentally, through no fault of their own, people who want to work, you know, people who have worked, simply be automated out of work because of companies that Sway is investing in. You know, we're, we're and and so how do, do you do you agree? Do you disagree? How do you think about the the full panoply? Well, every industrial revolution has impacted a generation negatively, right? This is the fourth one, and we've talked about the fourth industrial revolution. So yeah, that, that will happen. Um, what can we do to minimize the impact? I think that's the best way to have this conversation. And, you know, everybody has a responsibility. You're investing in companies that will eliminate some of these jobs. Well, what else are you doing? 
we just uh, launched a partnership with Goodwill. So Goodwill has a workforce development initiative. And they do a lot of training and they help people get prepared to re-enter the workforce. Many of these people who've been homeless for a number of years. And we basically went in and it's, we're piloting here in San Francisco to, to, to train people on how to use technology to find work. And you can find work on TaskRabbit. And the team was really nervous because they wanted to be successful. And they're like, these aren't like normal taskers. They didn't just register online. And they got there. And there's one guy who he didn't have a bank account. So one of the TaskRabbit employees was like, all right, we got three hours. Let's just get you a bank account. Can't make money on TaskRabbit until you have a bank account. And for whatever reason, he hadn't set one up. And that didn't matter. What mattered is, is we were here right now, so we're just going to get you set up. We're going to find a bank. Then you're going to put your information in. We're going to set you up with a bank account. And now you can complete the registration process. And we're going to mentor that group for the next two months to make sure that they have the information and the tools that they need to be successful. And that's through our TaskRabbit for Good program. But it's, it's not just about saying for good because... We should do good. We should all do some good. Go do some good. But it's important. We know that there's a community that is already lost and has already missed this opportunity. And so we are taking the time to go in and give them a chance, at least right now, to find a way to find work through any gig economy platform. We want you to find success on TaskRabbit, but if you don't have a bank account, you can't get paid through any of them in the United States. If you don't have, you know, you don't have to have a car for everything, but if you don't have a car, that doesn't work. So if you don't, if you can't get a background check, what do you now do? We're exploring, like, how do we get around some of the structural barriers that have prevented people from getting access to resources and ways of working that exist for a lot of people today. And I think we just have a responsibility to find those pockets where it's adjacent to what you're doing as a company and just do those things. Yeah. Now, I, I think that's, that, that's spot on. The, the other thing that I am really thoughtful about personally, you know, there are conversations more broadly about safety nets. Uh, now, safety nets are great, they're needed, and whether it's universal basic income or one of my favorites, frankly, is a, is a uh, national service model as, as, a, as a way to allow people to earn a safety net around housing, education, and, um, and uh, health care, as an example. You know, not anything necessarily that someone would aspire to, but it's something that would catch someone and allow them to begin building skills. But, so uh, when, 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 you, when you think about the difference between what we see today, you're talking about the very real and needed tactical approach to helping people today. And I'm wondering if you are, have thought about so the more the strategic policy issues, because I think we have to do both and quickly. I don't see this in the national discourse today. Yeah, I, um, you know, there's, We've talked a lot about what is the social safety net that we have, businesses, right? And then there's, oh, the government needs to figure this out, the business needs to figure this out. Um, I think we all have a responsibility in community. We all live somewhere in a community, and if those communities are gone, that's horrible. And I saw that in my city, Detroit. Like, I went back home, and there are literally entire communities that are gone. And um, to say who's responsible actually doesn't really matter. What matters is that it happened. And so there is a responsibility that we all have from the federal system all the way down to make sure that people can find a way to have a meaningful income and a meaningful life. And I don't think it's just one person's responsibility. It's the responsibility of a community that has multiple stakeholders. That is the people who are part of that community, that is the businesses that are part of that community, and that is the government that sets the laws and the regulations for that community. Well, I'm going to turn it to the audience. Um, we have our guest here who has been on the journey. 
uh, for those of us in the venture space, it's the hero's journey. It is the ultimate example of kind of how you um, figure out a way to add value in people's lives or add value in enterprise. At, deliver something that people are willing to pay for, but also is fundamentally, I think, a, a good thing for society. And, uh, and, and get to the other side in terms of being able to do something good for their employees, but also monetize it and end up in a, in a way where this could get even bigger in, uh, with inside of a, uh, one of the global great brands in the world. So with that, I would say, what questions do you have? Okay, so for those of you that did not hear me, I think that TaskRabbit is one of, the, one of the very positive actors in this ecosystem and one of the very positive actors for the future of work. But when we think about it, over the last 30 years, 81% of the manufacturing jobs in the United States have disappeared, not because of immigration, not because of globalization, not because of Mexican and, or Indian workforces, but because of automation. And you, you made the comment that it doesn't matter who, who's responsible, it's something that we have to deal with. But I think that all of us as participants in the technology revolution and as folks that are very involved in new technology and innovation, I think we all do have a responsibility here. And I think a lot of folks in the United States just don't understand what the ramifications of the technology that all of us are either investing in or supporting will have. And I think you look at Congress and you look at the Mark Zuckerberg trials or the when he came up to Congress and he talked to Congress, there's a lack of understanding of how technology works and of the ramifications of technology. And I think all of us need to be looking at systematic changes and really pushing those forward. And it is things like a universal living wage or other things of that matter. And I think all of us do need to be concerned more about that. I mean, yes, TaskRabbit's fantastic, but there's a lot of technology companies that are coming out that are destroying jobs and are not creating. I and mean, one of the great things about what you're doing is that you are actually creating jobs. You are actually creating opportunities. But I think all of us have a responsibility to be spending a lot more time thinking about the negative sides of what we're doing because there are some, some very major negative sides of what we're doing. I guess it's not really a question. It's just, as you said earlier, I'm making a statement. <laughs> it's a good statement. So we just made an investment in a company called Career Karma that's founded by Ruben Harris and the Meister brothers that started breaking into startups. Um, and I think they did a talk about what the CBC Tech Summit did it or wants to do in 2020, I think that you were part of. And one of the elements that struck us about what they were doing was that they're focusing on what needs to happen on the retraining, on the educational components that would potentially help people be part of the future of work. So obviously with a platform like TaskRabbit, you, know, you gave a great example of somebody who taught themselves something new around electrical engineering in a weird way to become a, you know, a high-skilled worker um, in terms of wages. How do you think about it as someone that can see from the purview of, of running TaskRabbit and working with a strong labor force, the role that retraining and, and maybe retooling the skill sets can play in the future of work? Yeah, I, um, that's, a, that's a really good question. We, um, we thought a lot about training, and one of the conflicts, if, there, if we could call it a conflict, that comes up with you have a you know, community of independent contractors is that the federal laws say, well, if you provide training, then there are employees, so then you have to pay for these other costs, but then the benefits aren't really there. And so a lot of us in the gig economy and the sharing economy have held back from creating you know, obvious training programs that we should provide. Now recently, some companies like Lyft, I think, has a college program where they'll actually provide scholarships to some of the drivers and in an effort 
to really try to provide different trainings. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to navigate those regulatory waters. So the waters aren't just about who provides the social safety net. It's also about looking at the current regulations and seeing which ones are systematically preventing from those of us who want to provide a safety net from providing the safety net. And let's like break those laws and like change those laws so we can actually do it. One thing I think is interesting is apprenticeships. Um, today we have kind of an apprenticeship where we pair taskers who are new to IKEA furniture assembly with taskers who've done it a lot before. Um, just because when you're new, when there's five boxes, like it's pretty intimidating. I've done tasks. We all task at TaskRabbit to stay proximate. And I walked in there and I was like, whoa. But the other tasker who was there was very experienced. And so we worked together to make sure that we got a, a good job done for the client. So how can we take this concept of apprenticeship somewhere else and make it bigger. And I think there's opportunities in community colleges, like are those programs really preparing people for the kind of workforce that they will enter or not? Um, or are they really still just a pre-college program that takes you to a four-year degree? Some people might not want the four-year degree. I have a four-year degree. I've benefited from the four-year degree. But can we really change the construct of apprenticeship programs and community colleges to create space. Those spaces exist, the structures exist, and now it's just the content, I think that would have to change to provide training and specific training on how to do certain skills, and then you can pair them up with people who are good at those skills. And I think that's a business, maybe government, but certainly educational system opportunity. Yeah, that's a, a really great point. If you, you know, we, we have a society in the US at least, we, we, we built this mentality that says, you, you come out of high school and you go to college. And it's almost like a badge of honor. If you're not going to college, you, you're failing. As opposed to with, in Europe, for instance, where there's a really clear path into, the, into sort of trades, uh, where, where um, and then the apprenticeship programs are really clear. I had this conversation earlier over lunch with, with Patrick and Lonnie, and, and, and that's one of the big differences we see in Europe is there's, psychologically there is not this sort of funneling everybody towards a four-year degree uh, when, when you could really be pushing people or helping people get to um, a different kind of tra training, a different level of training where you, would, you, know, you wouldn't have as many sort of these degrees where the chances of them getting a job are very, very low. In this. So that, I think that's a really important point. And you, you raised a great point, which is what are the institutional barriers to that? And one of them is, if you think about the trade, uh, sort of educational trade, it's kind of these private schools that are reasonably predatory. <laughs> you know? and, and so we've, we've got kind of some issues there as well. So I'll, I'll take the next question. Oh, right here. It's going to be me this time. Um, uh, hello, uh, it was a great talk, basically. Um, so you hear my strong French accent, so I'm going to try to you know, express myself correctly. But if it's not very clear, you can re-ask, and I will actually restate the thing, right? So um, I, it's more a comment, basically, and, and to bring, actually, experience from the real world. So I'm the CEO of a small company we're called Presence AI. And we basically enable appointment making businesses to uh, become available over voice enabled devices like Alexa or over texting so that you can actually book an appointment by just saying to Alexa, Alexa, book my next haircut. And obviously we do that mostly automatically, right? There is no actually human involved in, in the path to actually book the appointment and it can also be done over text. Um, so we, when we started, obviously the, the key the key uh, sort of a fear was how will actually the businesses react? Because basically what we're doing, we're sort of doing a technology that replaces the guest service team somehow. And so we started a little bit like that and got feedback you know, from a lot of the businesses because we went out of the building right, and talked to the potential customers. And we realized that actually the people in the business did also feel a lot of pain because they, uh, people don't like to pick up the phone you know, uh, as a customer, but also as a business person. And so part of the automation that we were actually bringing was also taking out of the realm actually the things that they didn't like day to day and allowing them actually to focus their efforts 
on the more value adding, I would say, tasks, like actually spending more time in the business with the customers that they see, right? So I think there is a component that we should also not forget there, which is the automation also takes away stuff that sometimes people don't like and actually allows new opportunities on value adding stuff there. And I think that's something going forward that, that is going to be very important, I think. It's an important point. There is work that is not actually um, worthwhile to the individual or honoring the individual. Yeah. Hi, uh, this was a great conversation. I work at LinkedIn um, primarily because I deeply believe in LinkedIn's mission of providing economic opportunity um, for everyone in the workforce. And like right now at LinkedIn, we're thinking about how that can extend to what we call beyond professionals. Um, so, you know, people in the gig economy, people, um, frontline workers, retail workers, et cetera. Um, and I really, uh, re like, resonated with me with what you said, which is, like, we should do this um, sort of, like, responsibility to the community, not because it's just good to do, um, but it's, like, really important and there is value that uh, comes out of that. Um, and you know, we owe it to our communities, and yeah, like companies like LinkedIn really believe that, but I'm wondering how do you actually make that work in a capitalistic society, right? Like what are the real incentives um, to make companies actually go out there and do this and enable people who uh, are getting put out of jobs because of automation or what have you, uh, retraining them, giving them uh, other opportunities, like outside of just doing it because it's the right thing to do, like how do you structure incentives around that? I think it goes back to where the money flows. Um, you know, most people that we hire at TaskRabbit, we ask them about their onboarding process, and um, almost 100% of the people will say, you know what, TaskRabbit for good was the reason why I came. There's literally like one slide about TaskRabbit for good in like the 100 slides in the onboarding orientation. We have a landing page about TaskRabbit for good that we do not market, we do not like tell anybody about it, people find it who are looking for what we, what we do. But it is like 99% of the time, they're like, that's why I came. They know nothing about it. And it's because there's an expectation that we are doing, we have a generation of people that we're hiring who have that expectation. And if we don't, that's how we're making decisions on the margin about where we go and where we work. And so if you are an investor, Think about where you spend your money. Who are you investing in? Are you investing in companies that actually care about the impact of the communities that they're making or not? And if you make that decision, then it will happen because people will create a program around it because they know that's where the investment is gonna come from. And guess what? The money will be there to actually make the investments work. And, and I'm gonna, so I'll be just slightly, I'll be a little more crass, which is, you know, in the venture capital, society, you know, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. We all, we all hope that the ethic is to do good, but capitalism typically runs on fear and greed. On the greed side, it is about ensuring that we have a consumer base that will continue to do, you know, buy products and services and keep the economic engine going if, I'm, if, if I set aside the humanity part. Of that, that, and, and, and on the fear side, if that group that is not participating in the economy gets large enough, then we are headed towards chaos. It's, it's as simple as that. There, you know, uh, we should be very fearful of uh, income inequality at the extreme because society falls over at some point. So there's another, another thought, not as eloquent or as beautiful as Stacy's comment, but I, I think at some base level, I fear for our system. I have a kind of a follow-on question for this, and thank you, this has really been uh, enlightening. Um, but my question revolves around the responsibility of investment funds to displaced workers. So as an example, people may be aware that Toys R Us bankruptcy displaced 33,000 workers, and that the 
private equity firms, KKR and Bain, have created a hardship fund to be able to pay these employees some type of a severance. So my question to you is, and then, and then as a follow-on, there are studies, and this is generally known in the venture community, that for early stage venture, early stage companies that are venture backed, that 60% of them or more fail. So being a venture backed entrepreneur and being a venture firm, what responsibility does a private equity fund or a venture capital fund have to those displaced workers? I don't have an answer. That's why I'm asking you. I think you both yeah. have, may have a perspective on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, one of the things that, that we do, and I think most venture capital firms do, is you invest in great teams. Um, first and foremost, that, you know, it, it, it almost, it starts with the team almost before the idea. <laughs> because, and, and, and by definition, those teams are people who could go anywhere and work. They are skilled, they're competent, they're credible, they are just talented. So, um, and, and the people that they hire likewise, because, you know, the proverbial looking for A players, you know. And, and while it's true that many ventures don't make it, my experience is that teams find their next, individuals find their next project. They're recruited away. As soon as they're available, somebody else wants them because they're that good. And, I, and so I, for most of us that do this kind of work and who have done it as entrepreneurs, you know, I always had this confidence that I'm going to push as hard as I can. If it doesn't work out, I, I can get a job. That's not an issue. You know, I'm, I'm competent. I'm good. I work hard. I can get another job. I'm chasing this mission because I believe in it. And if we don't get home, there'll be another mission to chase. So that's kind of how I think about it. And that's why I, I think it's great to be able to have enough capital left to pay a severance. Um, I, I, I have you know, seen companies hit the wall at 10,000 miles an hour and there not be a severance. Um, and that's horrible, but it happens. Um, but most of the time, for the people that we're talking about at these high-powered uh, startups that we're investing in, um, getting another job is the least of their concerns. The, the, you know, the moment that they're available, they're snapped up. I'm so glad you brought the point about like capital left to pay a severance because there is there is the moment where it's like do we spend it or do we take care of people even though they're going to find another job it's going to take two weeks or three weeks or whatever and they have bills to pay and they have a baby at home or whatever and I think you know a a responsible investor will help a founder think through that thoughtfully. Um, a great board member and investor will stick with the founder through all of it um, and until the end. And, you know, I've heard some investors say, well, my companies aren't really doing that well. I'm just going to, like, let's see what happens. And that's just not okay, right? That is when they want you around the least but need you the most. Um, and for those of us who are parents, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so I, I think as an entrepreneur, I want an investor who's going to be there through thick and thin and actually be there. And for that tough call, being able to help them make that call on taking care of people. The other thing I would say is just the transparency. Like the statistic that you put out, 60%, this is what happened, is kind of generally known. But nobody really thinks it's going to be their company that they're at. Even though the statistic says majority of these companies will not make it, it's not going to be mine. And as, a, as an entrepreneur, I think the transparency is really important. Now, you can't be transparent about everything. Obviously, I couldn't tell everybody we sold the company like the day before we sold the company. I had to tell them on the day that we did it. But being as transparent as possible about where we are. I take our company through our company board presentation after every board meeting, within two weeks after every board meeting, people see everything that the board saw. They know exactly where we are, what the strategy is, and what we're doing. And so you have full information about what's going on in the business. And as an employee, you can make decisions on how much risk 
you're willing to take on, how much belief you have in the leadership of that company, and whether or not you want to stick it out or go and find and do something different. And I often think that a lot of entrepreneurs aren't as transparent because they're really afraid that people might leave or they might tell. But the transparency I found actually creates trust, and the trust creates retention. And the retention is kind of what you need to navigate some of those really difficult times in a startup. Yeah, that, that, the comment that you made about trust is really important. And I'll just share with you, because Stacey brought it up, was my first experience, my very first startup. Uh, this was you know, a company that I founded in uh, you know, uh, late 99, 2000. Uh, a managed service provider in the telco space. Think of Ring Central or 8x8 before it's time, kind of voiceover. ATM, because I, I voice over IP wasn't ready. And we were going great guns. We're beating our plan. I'd raised $15 million, 90 employees. We're crushing our plan. We have 50 um, customers installed, another 70 in the pipeline. Things are going great. And then the first internet bubble hits. And I went from having people calling me, begging to get in the deal, to people going, Ken who? What? <laughs> I'm not taking a telecom service provider deal to my partners. And you know, we went out and tried to raise funds. I called my, the VC, uh, Crosspoint, some of you guys met, met him. I called Seth Nyman uh, and had the conversation. I said, Seth, um, doesn't look good. You know, and I got, I've got a million, a million and a quarter left. And um, I don't think we're going to get home. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hit the wall at 10,000 miles an hour because all these customers that I've sold, we're their front door. They go dark. If I go dark, they go dark. Plus we, so Seth said, he listened to my sort of half hour analysis of, you know, and I'm, I'm basically trying to build the courage to say, I think we need to wind the business down. And he listened, he didn't say a word, and he said, it makes sense to me. How can I help? What do you need? We spent the next, we spent that million and a quarter over the next, you know, four months basically moving the customers to other solutions. The management team went on, you know, we basically worked for free and we paid the employees and gave some folks found other jobs. We were able to have enough to severance people out. But it was, it was a traumatic experience at the time for a first time CEO. Um, but it, you know, we didn't file for bankruptcy. We literally wound the business down in a controlled fashion. And I've had a lot of successes in my career. That's the one I'm most proud of. So we have, uh, we have time for one more. I'm actually going to ask it, so I'm, I'm going to be selfish in that way. Um, so we've covered the gamut of government. We've covered the gamut of you know, what public, private can do. You know, I think a lot of us in this room envision a future where my smart refrigerator has a filter that breaks and has an API call that goes to TaskRabbit and a tasker comes and fixes it, right? That's, that's the vision, right? I don't have to do anything and everything is automated. So Stacey, I would uh, thank you so much. I want to know, what does the future of TaskRabbit look like? like? What gets you up in the morning and gets you excited about where TaskRabbit is going? I'm so excited for that, for that future. Um, I had to order something and we have, we're very democratic in our household, not about how we vote, but also, but also about like, the tools that we use. So we have Alexa and we have the Google Assistant and my kids kind of play them off each other. So I needed to order something and my, my daughter goes, mommy, you know you can just ask Alexa to reorder that, right? And I wish I didn't have to ask. Like I just wish the reordering just sort of happened. Um, so that future where you're just communicating one piece of technology is communicating to another piece of technology that a service needs to be done makes me so happy. We all have this storm cloud of to-dos in our head, right? And it just weighs us down. And so the future of TaskRabbit is that we just take that away from you. We become your task management network. We're your help for life. We're your trusted person and community that can help you get those things done. And so the person who replaces the filter is not the person who does the electrical, who's not the person who does, who cleans the gutters, but they're all communicating with each other and they're all communicating with the technology that enables it. And so things just sort of happen 
visitors come for the holidays and things happen, that extra room needs to get cleaned and like someone shows up because we know they're arriving on the 23rd, so they show up on the 22nd. I mean, there's a lot about automation that is not scary to me. I think somebody raised the point that the automation actually makes us feel a little bit better and it makes that storm cloud in my mind just a little bit easier um, to get to get through. So we want to be the company that really helps bring you help for life, whatever that is. Stacy, great pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for making time. Uh, it's really an honor to, and so uh, please join me in um, thanking our wonderful guests. Thank you.